So I'm Emily, good to see you guys. And I have scrolled through here. I see a few uh, familiar names. So hello to those of you I do know. And thank you so much for joining today. And thank you to Steve and the CFC Academy for inviting me to be a part of this. I am thrilled um, to, be, to be here with you guys tonight. So as we know, we're talking about nutrition for soccer players tonight. I don't have to read it verbatim, but the one thing I do want to point out, which is part of why I love sports nutrition so much, is that I would consider myself an athlete um, still to this day. I did play volleyball in college, and um, since then, I've just remained active. I I've done lots of, um, you know, running events, and so I love to be able to implement the things that I work with people on as well. Also, I'm a mom of two little kiddos, so an eight and a six-year-old, one of which does play for the um, IDP program, and he has loved that. Um, why is nutrition important? We're going to talk about these things today. So why nutrition is important for athletes, specifically soccer players, how soccer players' nutrient needs are unique. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of strategies for maximizing nutrient intake to positively impact performance with, app with various applications, meaning... I'll show you a few ways to apply those things. Um, and then we'll talk about a few special considerations for female athletes, especially adolescent female athletes, which is this general population that we're, that we're uh, with today. Um, and then we'll look at a, what a performance plate should look like for soccer players during the training season. And then we'll have time for some questions. So first off, why is nutrition important for athletes, for soccer players? Well, the main thing that, you know, a lot of times people will be in practice or a training session or um, whatever it is that they're doing, whether it's soccer, or any, any sport or um, athletic event, and they get home and they're ravenous and they, they proceed to eat whatever they see and sight, um, but then they go to the game or to the practice the next day and they just feel sluggish and tired and they just don't have as much energy to get them through their games as they used to. But they don't take the time to think about what they're eating and how that can impact their performance. So nutrition plays a huge role in all of these um, aspects. So it uh, supports training and good health. And that's the main thing that I like to focus on, especially with adolescents, is that it's not just about nutrition for performance is nutrition for good health. We want to ensure and instill that good quality nutrition now that they can carry on throughout the rest of their lives. Good nutrition can improve the way an athlete feels before, during, and after a game. So true. So as people start to change and tweak their diets a little bit, they're able to see that they really do feel different. Um, I'll give an example. One time my son, uh, again, he's six, but he went to a, um, he went to a friend's house and that friend decided to take them to get duck donuts who also ended up getting a milkshake at the same time. And then he went to American Ninja Warrior class and he started, this was probably a year and a half ago, he started crying halfway into it. And then he realized I literally just had a sugar high and he completely lost it. He dropped. And so if we don't feed our and fuel our bodies appropriately, even in these young ages, it can absolutely affect our performance and how we feel before, during, and after exercise sessions. Good nutrition can help us improve specific components of fitness goals. So um, specifically for soccer players, this might be speed. It might be endurance. Um, other players, it could, for a goalie, it might be strength. It might be plyometrics, being able to jump, being able to reach really high and far. Um, so those specific components can be impacted by the nutrition, by, the, by what we put in our bodies. Um, it certainly supports injury prevention and overtraining. Injury prevention, prevention is the key there. If we are fueling our bodies appropriately, we're getting necessary nutrients that are going to be able to help us um, maintain our bone health, our structure, our brain health, all of our muscle mass. All those things play a role in um, helping to support in, uh, injury prevention and overtraining. And also certainly it can help with maximizing performance for selected events. What I mean by that would be if there's a competition where you have a tournament and you have multiple games all weekend. So those types of um, events that you can train for. Nutrition is periodized. So what might be taking place for your athlete or for you if you're a coach um, or a parent 
um, or player, what might be taking place right now could be very different from what you should be working on from a nutrition standpoint in the summer. So you might be in a preseason, you might be in a postseason, you might be right in the middle of competition season. And those nutritional aspects can um, fluctuate just a little bit um, during those various seasons. And think about it in terms of what is the intensity level? How, how much is my athlete or how much am I um, going hard during my training sessions? Is it five days a week? Is it two days a week? All these things play a role in whatever overall nutrition um, should look like at that time. This is important. So energy availability is the energy left over after exercise for normal physiological functions. So whatever we're consuming from a um, calorie standpoint, from an energy standpoint, energy is used for that exercise session, for soccer, for your practices, for your training sessions, for your games. And then whatever's left over is then used for what our bodies need for um, normal functioning. If we're not providing our bodies with a necessary amounts and necessary uh, nutrients, then that can impact your health. And that's where that comes in. Well, you guys probably know, um, you can run up to five to seven miles in a game. So a lot of movement, a lot of action, but it's not just endurance. There's some times where you might be just kind of jogging around and then all of a sudden you have to sprint off to go uh, get a ball or to, um, you know, if somebody passes to you. Um, so it's a it's both anaerobic and aerobic energy that's utilized during these session during the games and training sessions. It is unique in that there is different there is different energy that's used, but specifically the in, the increase in energy needs is there because of the activity that's being done. We also have to think about the tournaments that you guys attend that might have multiple games involved. Um, whether it's one, two games a day or three games a day, or even maybe two on a Saturday and two on a Sunday, um, all of those can impact, um, you know, how much nutrients we need and how much uh, we need to really focus on what's on our plate during those times. We have high calorie needs. Soccer players have high calorie needs. So one question that I did get asked for this session is, what are the calorie needs for soccer players? What are they for adolescents? And the answer is, we have... First of all, we have a wide variety of participants tonight between coaches, players, parents. I definitely want to make sure to recognize that it's most important, especially with adolescents at this age, to focus not just on calorie intake, but most importantly, more importantly, of the overall makeup of what is on those plates. For the most part, if those, if those are met, if we are getting adequate things on our plates, adequate food groups, macronutrients, micronutrients, then the calories will be met. However, I will say that the range could be from anywhere between from um, 2,200 to 3,000 calories a day for people between 12 and 18 years old. That's a wide range. I realize that. However, we don't, it's very, it's, um, it's variable from athlete to athlete. That's because we don't know if this one athlete plays soccer and then they go and play basketball for two hours. Or if they play soccer, they have a soccer practice and then they go home and they play outside with their buddies for three hours. You know, so that varies from person to person. So it's hard to pinpoint exact recommendation for an exact age group because it's so variable based on other factors that are taking place. Um, but that does give you an, an idea of the high calorie, high energy needs that are necessary for athletes in this, um, in this age range and for soccer players. So I show this, this picture and this quote, I think it just kind of goes right along with what was just said. So during the first two decades of our life, our skeleton grows in size and density, and it's estimated that greater than half of peak bone mass is acquired during the teen years. Why do I bring this up? Because it goes back to the what's made, what our diet is made up of, what's on our plates can is so important during this time frame that it, it can impact our bone health for the future. I don't want that to scare you because it shouldn't. Um, but the key is if we can kind of keep track of these strategies that we'll discuss today then your child will be fine. You will be fine 
you will be great. Um, and we really want to maximize that performance, but to maximize our performance now and as adults, then we want to try to fine tune our nutrition as a teenager um, so that we can make sure that we are not only providing food to our body for soccer, but providing food to our body for overall health. We definitely wanna plan for success, right? So just like you have to plan for your training sessions, you go to practice, you go to your games, just like you plan for um, various plays that you have during those games or at a practice, you plan for that. So we also should plan for our nutrition. Um, if, if we plan and we have adequate nutrients, adequate uh, calories, adequate micro macronutrients and a balanced plate, then athletes are gonna be less likely to miss school. They're gonna be less likely to be out of school for injuries and then also have better health overall. Um, this does take time and effort. It's not something where we can just say, okay, I've practiced tomorrow and I'm going to, I don't know what I'm gonna eat. So we have to plan ahead. It's, it's better if we plan ahead than being famished when you get home from a practice and just grabbing whatever you can or being so hungry that you go to the vending machine and find the first thing that you see, whether there's healthy options or not. Um, or even the concession stand. It's hard to get things from a concession stand. Um, a lot of times they don't have super healthy options. Um, so today we're gonna talk about some strategies for, uh, for healthy eating. So number one, you guys probably aren't super surprised about this one, but maybe you are, but there's so much um, misinformation about the, uh, out there on the internet. Um, about diets. And this is the thing that from a soccer, soccer player standpoint, <clears throat> I don't recommend a diet. I recommend eating a balanced, having a balanced plate and eating with a performance plate in mind. And number one on the list should be carbohydrates for soccer players. As I told you, very high energy needs. We have high energy needs. We're burning calories very quickly, but our energy needs are the body and the brain's main source of energy are carbohydrates. And so that's gonna be the first nutrient, the first macronutrient that's used in soccer when we're practicing, when we're at games. So we want to make sure that the majority, at least half of our diet is made up of carbohydrates. Now you see on the pictures here, lots of variety. So that doesn't mean you have to cut out anything necessarily from a carbohydrate standpoint. But it does mean that we want to make sure that we are maximizing our carbohydrate choices. Also, carbohydrates are our brain, our brain's main source of energy as well. Why is this important? Well, school. We're talking adolescents here. Adults as well, but adolescents. We want to make sure that we are able to think clearly at school. So it helps us, helps our, helps our brain function. It helps us think clearly. But what about on the soccer field? It helps us make those quick decisions um, while we're on the soccer field. So carbohydrates are your body and your brain's main source of energy. Carbohydrate availability is increased hours to days prior to an activity. So what that means is you can consume carbohydrates and say if an athlete just consumes carbohydrates the night before a game, that's great, but it's not just that carbohydrate loading right before a game that's important. It's the carbohydrate that's consumed throughout the week that leads up to that game. So the key is just making sure that at all times, at all meals, that we do include some carbohydrates in that meal. Here's where we'll do some application. We'll apply some of that information. So 55 to 65% of our overall diet, of a soccer player's overall diet, should be from carbohydrates. 55 to 65%. So five grams, that means five grams per kilogram per day. So to get your kilograms or your athletes kilograms, you take your weight in pounds and divide that by 2.2. So that gives you your kilograms. So five grams per kilogram per day is average. But when we're in a high training period or a competition season, those needs go up. So that goes up to seven to 12 grams per day. And that can vary based on the age and the intensity of that athlete. An example would be a 15 year old weighing 99 pounds 
um, playing soccer every day or a uh, second sport. So maybe they play soccer or they play a second sport also, they would need about 450 grams of carbs per day. In contrast, a male that's 18 and weighs about 150 pounds, their needs are as high as 800 grams of carbohydrates a day when they're playing soccer and incredibly um, active outside of the soccer field. Maybe they play a second sport as well. So huge carbohydrate needs. But remember, that might sound high to you, but remember the energy needs are very high as well. So that aligns with that 55 to 65% of the overall diet. We wanna include half of your plate as carbohydrates at each meal. So imagine, I'll show you a picture in a little bit, but just imagine your plate. Put your hands down on right below you, imagine a plate, and you just draw a line across half of your plate. Half of that plate, you want to be filled up with carbohydrates, okay? Keep that in mind, and then we'll trudge on to our next sections. But what does that mean? Whole grains should be included at most meals. <clears throat> we don't want our carbohydrates to come from potato chips, the majority of them. Occasionally we can have those, but when we're talking about a quality performance plate, quality performance diet, half of that plate should be filled with quality complex carbohydrates. Complex would be like your oats, so oatmeal for breakfast, for example. You can even have oatmeal as a snack, and it's an excellent source of um, carbohydrates, but also very filling for snacks. Uh, barley, whole wheat flour, brown rice, whole wheat pasta, farro, personal favorite here. I love that stuff. Whole wheat bread, and then hot and cold cereals. So those are all really great options at most meals. You also want to include starchy vegetables. So those could be bee, beans, peas, corn, potatoes. Those are all considered starchy vegetables or high high quality carbohydrate vegetables. Um, so those can also be a part of that half of the plate that you're um, consuming that you have at each meal time. Strategy number two. So this is protein. You see the pictures here. We Protein would be your chicken, beef, pork, turkey, ham, fish, eggs, some of the cheeses that you see here. Um, why is this important? Protein helps to build muscles, build muscle mass but it's also important for repairing those muscles, okay? So the growth and recovery of our muscle cells, um, it also is super important for immune function. It can help us to maintain our heart health and our respiratory health, but it also speeds recovery after exercise. So you may or may not have heard but of this, but right after exercise is a really crucial period to get in certain nutrients. Carbohydrates are one of them. Go back to that number one strategy and protein is the other one. So the, it's key because once we, when we're out doing soccer, doing training, if you guys do weight training, any type of activity that's gonna utilize your muscles, it's going to break them down. So the protein is very important to rebuild what your body has just broken down from exercise. Um, it's also vital <clears throat> for the growth and development of children and adolescents. Um, it increases satiety at meals and snacks, and it's also actually important for hormones, hormone development, and keeping those in check as well. So for young athletes, we want to aim for around 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kilogram per day, and this should make up about 20 to 30 percent of your overall diet, 55 to 65 for carbohydrates and 20 to 30 for your protein. So protein, again, do the math. You can kind of get an estimate for yourself on your kilograms. So pounds divided by 2.2 to give you those, those numbers. Um, but approximately 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kilogram per day. Certainly those needs can be, be higher if it's, a, let's say, a high school athlete who's doing weight training plus soccer and doing these multiple days of the week. And those needs can be determined and tweaked accordingly and on an individual basis. Animal sources of protein, as we see here, and we've already mentioned, those are really important. And the reason that the animal sources are going to provide you with essential amino acids. So that means they have all of the amino acids in them that we can't, that our bodies cannot make. So we have to get them from food. There are athletes that are vegetarians all over the world. Um, and they can get adequate amino acids also from their diet, 
they just have to make sure that they're including sources that are high in leucine, which is an essential amino acid, and all the essential amino acids, getting a variety of those foods kind of throughout the day, all day, every day. Um, and so the, those examples would be <clears throat> your peanut butter, soy milk, black beans, tofu, almonds, lentils, things like that. Um, so for example, a 12 year old female that's 87 pounds needs about 47 to 55 grams of protein per day. This can be achieved from two eggs and yogurt at breakfast, three ounces of turkey at lunch, string cheese an afternoon for an afternoon snack, and then three ounces of a meat sauce uh, with spaghetti at dinner. So those are ways that you can incorporate that protein in small amounts throughout the day. Strategy number three. So that would be to focus on our healthy fats. So it's easy to, um, to talk about fats because fat is in a lot of foods that we eat, right? But it's really important that we're making sure that we are consuming the right types of fats. Fat is an essential nutrient to help us absorb certain vitamins. We have fat soluble, fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And so in order for our bodies to adequately absorb those and use those nutrients from all food groups, then fat is, is an essential uh, nutrient that we need to consume. Um, fat is also necessary for, for hormone production. Um, you notice the pictures here are not milkshakes, they're not hamburgers, they're not french fries, they are healthy fats. So that's why it's important to, we wanna make sure that we're consuming those healthy, healthy fats most often. Not to say that you're athlete, not to say that you as an athlete can't have milkshakes, you can't have hamburgers, you can't have french fries. No, that's not the case. We want to just make sure that the majority of the time we are eating healthy fats. Um, and we'll talk, I'll, I'll give you some other examples in a second. So 15 to 20% of our overall diet will be from uh, fats. Now, the key here though, is that if we focus on half of our plate for carbohydrates and a, for about a fourth of your plate for protein, the fat is going to fall into place with your diet. So that's where that 15 to 20% of your overall diet will just fall into place if we're eating those other uh, parts of our plate appropriately. So fat should be included at all meals with the majority coming from those unsaturated fat choices. So the picture of the oil here and then the previous one with the nuts and the avocado, excellent sources of fat, healthy fats that are not only healthy fats for, um, for our body and our hormones, but for our heart's health as well. So if we're learning to eat these types of healthy fats now, then it's going to help us as we get older um, you know, we're going to end up enjoying those types of foods later on in life as well. <clears throat> so work on all these things now to, to think about the future as well. So the flaxseed, chia seeds, and sunflower seeds, those can be eaten alone. They can be added to overnight oats. They can be sprinkled on salads. You can put them in yogurt. You can put them in cereal. You can mix them in muffins. You can you can add these in all different ways. Um, in fact, you can use chia seeds and flaxseed in place of eggs and or butter in many cases. Olive oil and canola oil should be your main source of oils that you're using to cook with. So they're good quality unsaturated fats and um, good for overall heart health, like I said, and uh, great, for, great for flavor as well. Avocados are excellent and then fatty fish. So Salmon, cod, mackerel, herring, those are good sources of fatty fishes that will give us quality and saturated fats as well. I also hear a lot, um, if we go back to the protein portion, which ties into the fat here, I hear a lot from parents that their kids don't like protein. They don't eat protein well. They don't eat chicken or beef well. So what I would encourage you to do, if that is the case for you or for your child, is to find something that they do like. So if it's a hamburger, then try to incorporate that into your family's meals, into the repertoire of meals that you make. Not necessarily every day or every, you know, not even twice or three times a week by any means, but incorporate that so that you know that there's these few meals that that child will eat. Similarly, if it's salmon, try to incorporate that in your meals throughout the, throughout the week. 
If it's uh, shrimp, try to incorporate that. Every family member may not necessarily love it or it may not necessarily be their favorite, but if that is this one child that you're concerned about, then I do encourage you to try to incorporate that into your family's meal plan. Strategy number four is to stay hydrated. So I think that a lot of parents and coaches um, and players here as well are familiar with this, but I did get a question several, actually several of you sent in questions about electrolyte beverages and the sports drinks. So we'll talk about that. But the key is to stay hydrated and the main source of fluid should be from water. So truly all day long, but the best suggestion I would love to share first off is start your day with water. So if you have a hard time getting water throughout the day, start out. As soon as you get out of bed, go drink a glass of water. Start, start it getting in your system um, to start the hydration process for the day. Um, you don't just hydrate right before a game. You need to be hydrating throughout the day, all day. Also, it's not recommended to start drinking at night when you get home because then that's going to impact your sleep. So if we get home and we realize, oh, I didn't drink that much today, I'm really thirsty, and then we start drinking, then that can impact our sleep because you might have to get up and go to the restroom once or twice throughout the night. Hydration doesn't just mean water. The majority of our fruits and vegetables are made up of water. So it has a very high water content. So yes, water is important. Yes, we should drink water at most meals and snacks and throughout the day. But those foods are actually contributing to your hydration status. So that's why it's important to incorporate those fruits and vegetables at all meals um, as well to add to that hydration status that you have. We definitely wanna consume plenty of water, um, but there is a place, especially with soccer, for those sports drinks. So the majority of what we're consuming should be water, but those sports drinks can be really beneficial after we've been training or at a game for more than 60 minutes. 60 to 90 minutes is when we should start utilizing those sports drinks but in moderation, because what oftentimes will happen is that if, if kids consume too much of those sports drinks, then it can cause stomach discomfort, stomach distress, and then that impacts their play. That's one part of it, but also we want, we're not losing that many electrolytes. So just limit the, um, the overall amount. Don't take in a gigantic bottle and then go back out and play. Do small increments throughout your game um, it's also beneficial to have right before a game. If you know it's a hot, humid day and you want to have just a little bit of a boost of electrolytes, and that is fine too. Um, and similarly, right after a game is fine as well. The key is that that shouldn't be your hydration throughout the day. The main hydration should be water throughout the day and then incorporate those electrolyte sports beverages <clears throat> right around your training and or game sessions. So here's a general um, idea for, for needs for hydration. So four hours prior to exercise, um, 0.2 to 0.25 ounces per kilogram of body weight. And then every 15 to 20 minutes during exercise, five to 10 ounces. And then for every 0.5 kilograms of body weight lost after exercise, you want to add 15 to 23 ounces. So this is important right here. Most of the time we can tell our hydration status from urine. You can tell based off the color of the urine. So if it's a very light colored, almost a pale lemonade color, then that's a pretty good indication of hydration, of that someone's hydration is, well, is good. But if it's a darker color, then hydration status is pretty low. So we want to make sure that those are great indicators for kids to think about and um, also for coaches and parents to talk to their kids about, um, you know, to help make sure that they are getting enough um, hydration throughout the day. The reason I said that is because this last column here can be utilized in cases where maybe you're going to a summer camp and um, or maybe you coach a summer camp and these kids are out in the heat for four, five hours a day, maybe in various times throughout the day if not more. And a way that you can measure hydration is by weighing them before and after a game 
or practice or training, whatever it is, to see how much they have lost and then add in um, the 15 to 23 ounces as necessary. So an example here would be a male athlete weighing 150 pounds should, con should consume six 12 to 16 ounces um, four hours prior to exercise. So again, something we don't wanna do is wait till right before game time to start drinking. It's really important to start that consumption of water and hydration throughout the day, early in the day, early and often. Again, electrolytes have a place. Sports drinks have a place. And that place really should be around those training sessions and not just because it sounds good. Um, because they can, they are, they do have added sugars. And so they can take the place of other nutrients that our stomach needs. So they'll fill us up and not make us hungry for food. But there are, they are beneficial for around those training sessions and game periods. The reason the chocolate milk is here is because it's actually been proven that it's a great hydration uh, beverage, but also especially after a training session to get some quick carbohydrates and protein in you. It has excellent, uh, an excellent carbohydrate to protein ratio of three to one. And that's important for replenishing the carbohydrates that you just utilized during your exercise and then rebuilding the muscles that you just broke down from the protein um, that's found in the milk from the, from the dairy. So one glass of milk is about eight grams of protein. Um, and then if you had one and a half, you know, it'd be closer to 12 grams of protein. So it's excellent for hydration, post training session, post game, but it's also excellent as a, uh, rebuilding those mus rebuilding the mus muscle mass and uh, replenishing your carbohydrate stores that you just lost and then rebuilding your muscles that you just broke down. Um, also, a lot of people will say that after they've played a long game or after they've been through a practice session, they don't have an appetite. And so that's where these beverages like a chocolate milk or a smoothie can come into play because maybe people are more interested in drinking something than eating something. So that's why these can be really beneficial. So here's a sample menu I thought you guys might find beneficial um, for just to kind of give you an idea of like a vegetarian versus a non-vegetarian menu that kind of breaks it down um, with, that it includes carbohydrates, it includes protein, it includes your fats. Um, so for breakfast for a non-vegetarian, two or three whole grain pancakes, they even make them these days with a little added protein in the freezer section. And those are completely fine to have on hand. They're really great because they're convenient, but the whole grain aspect is the key. Um, have some low fat yogurt with that, maybe a turkey and vegetable omelet um, and blueberries on top of the yogurt with some walnuts on top of the yogurt and then a little syrup for the pancakes. I love adding peanut butter on top of pancakes for some added healthy fats, um, but that's not for everybody. Um, lunch, whole wheat tortilla with pretzels, grilled chicken in a, torti in a tortilla, um, spinach leaves and tomato. So you're basically eating it like a wrap with a fresh fruit salad. You can put your avocado and hummus in the tortilla as well. And then water or an electrolyte sports drink. This is here because maybe you have, um, this is your lunch and then maybe you have practice at 2.30 and you're not gonna have a chance to eat again. This is where those could be beneficial as well. But again, it really depends on the training day and the training type at that period of um, their uh, period of their career. So water should be the main source again. Sample dinner, whole grain pasta and a dinner roll with meatballs, meat sauce, oil-based salad dressing for the salad um, and broccoli and water and uh, water or milk. The milk actually at night is really beneficial again because of the protein. During the nighttime, we really repair muscles that have been broken down also. So that protein, adding some a little bit of protein at nighttime, especially like right before bed, actually can be really beneficial for repairing those muscles overnight. Okay, a vegetarian menu here, two or, uh, two or three whole grain protein pancakes, full fat Greek yogurt, blueberries, and walnuts on top. Sample lunch, similar to what was on the other side, but instead of the chicken, it's actually a chickpea salad um, and you can make it with avocados. Then you can add the spinach and tomatoes in there, have the fresh fruit salad on the um, side, 
and then add the hemp seeds or the nutritional yeast to the uh, chickpea salad for added omega-3s. Those are your healthy fats and added protein as well. And then the cup of soy milk is beneficial there for some added protein. And then the, the dinner would be your pasta with your dinner roll, vegetarian ground beef. So that could be uh, vegan crumbles. I'm sorry, veggie crumbles. And then adding those portobello mushrooms with tomato sauce for the pasta sauce is great with broccoli and some soy milk. Strategy number five, focus on nutrient timing. So oftentimes people tell me that they wake up and they're not hungry. They don't wanna eat breakfast, they go straight to school. So I'm sure you guys have all heard the age old saying of <laughs> breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Well, you know, especially with athletes, this is true. You wake up and you need to jumpstart your metabolism, but also just start the fueling process, the hydration process, first thing in the day. You may not have a huge appetite, and that doesn't mean you have to have a full on breakfast, but it's very important to have something first thing in the morning to jumpstart your appetite, jumpstart your metabolism and start the fueling process. Um, so after you do that, after you have breakfast, it's ideal to consume more meals throughout the day about every three to four hours. So think of this, like food is our fuel. Think about when you go to the gas station and fill up your car with gas, you fill it up because it's empty, right? You're not going to go anywhere else if the gas tank is empty. Similarly, if we're not appropriately fueling our system, jump starting that day with fuel, then our system is not going to work nearly as well. And I'm not just talking about the soccer field. I'm talking about in the classroom too. Body and brain's main source of energy is carbohydrates. Remember that. So we need to jump start that fueling process first thing in the day so that we can have that energy to get through our day. Um, so you do want to eat every three to four hours. Um, this is proven to help with lowering body fat, improving energy levels, improving strength and performance. So very beneficial to, uh, to eat every three to four hours. Um, but it's also important to include a little carbs and protein at all of those time frames. Okay. So let's say the healthy snacking will kind of be between those as well. Let's say you have lunch at 12 o'clock, but your practice is right after school. So I know we're talking CFC, the practices are typically in the evening times, but maybe you play for a soccer team at your school. Those are typically right after school, as far as I know. So you go, you have lunch at 12, but then you go straight to practice right after school at three o'clock, give or take, right? So ideally we wanna have, try to have some type of a snack around 2.30. And when I say snack, I'm talking a pretty small snack that should be mostly carbohydrates to energize that session that you're about to enter into, okay? So around 2.30, having a snack to help you get through that workout and help to reduce fatigue. So your pre and post game training meals should be uh, high in carbohydrate. Ideally, three hours prior to your game time, you wanna have something to eat. So high in carbohydrate, low in fat and protein. Oftentimes we get out there, you're running really hard or you're running endurance, you're running for a long time, your digestive system may not handle high fat foods. It's probably not going to be able to break, it won't be able to break down the protein as adequately either. So we want to focus on our higher carbohydrate meal uh, about, three, about three hours prior to game time. Not too bulky and easy to, easy to, to digest. But it's also important to experiment with different foods because what works for two people on your team may not work for you, right? So it's important to experience, uh, experiment with various foods to find out what works for you. What makes your stomach feel decent when you're playing, when you're practicing? Because um, that's where, you know, some people can handle more like a whole wheat bread with peanut butter and jelly before a game, but other people just can't handle that high fiber bread so they opt for the white bread. Applesauce is great. Pretzels are great. Try banana and dry cereal. Those are great too. And as you see here, if you can't get something in up to three hours before a game, think about like the weekends. If you don't want to wake up, you prefer to sleep. You still need to eat something, but choose something that's easily digestible like the examples provided here. Right after our training session and within, ideally within 60 minutes of your training session or game, 
you want to try to eat something. And that something should be around 45 to 50 grams of carbohydrates pretty quickly. Um, I've worked with athletes before who will, um, they'll say, I finished, I, fin I finished practice and I get home and I'm just starving. And the, I just, while I'm waiting for dinner to cook, I'll grab a bag of chips or I'll grab pretzels or I'll grab um, candy just because they're so hungry that they just will grab whatever they see. So if we can plan ahead and be prepared for that feeling, then you will be able to get in those 55, 45 to 50 grams of carbohydrates immediately after your training session. All right, so this is just a quick showing of the time breakdown. So if you do incorporate those snacks, let's say you have 6.30 a.m., uh, you get up and you have breakfast of peanut butter and jelly sandwich on white bread, and then you go to your game or practice at 8. And then at 9.45 is when you're going to have your breakfast. That includes that half a plate with carbs, some protein, and um, some healthy fats and fruits. Um, so this kind of gives you a breakdown of how to, to spread out those meals and the times for, for game days. So if you have, if you have time between games, great. Um, if you don't, if you have time between games to eat a solid meal, that's great. But if you don't, it's still important to get in something with some high quality carbohydrates, something that's going to be easily digestible and be able to be used for a quick energy source. So here's where we get to the tournaments. Again, it's super important to plan ahead. Maybe you have a few parents on the team who like to um, do signups. Maybe you're typically in charge of doing signups for various things. Um, this is a great opportunity to have um, people sign up for certain things. But instead of saying, hey, will you bring a snack? Give them a specific list. And that might sound crazy, but hopefully a lot of your teammates and parents are on the, on the call today or on the Zoom today. Um, but give them a specific list to bring or specific item to bring that you know that would be healthy for everyone on the team based off of what you've learned. So maybe you could do that. Also, one thing to keep in mind for athletes, especially, and parents to help, parents and coaches to help um, to, to remind them of this, but we don't want to overdrink and undereat. So what oftentimes can happen at tournaments is that they're so hot all they want to do is drink. They want to guzzle that Gatorade. They want to guzzle that Powerade because they're just hot and they want to replenish their thirst, right? But if we're drinking all of those, drinking all the fluids, then it's taking the place of what our body really needs. And that's quality carbohydrates from nutritional sources. So while hydration is absolutely pertinent, it's also important to not over drink and under eat. So incorporating those good food sources throughout the day at tournaments is helpful but you have to plan ahead. Grab a cooler, pack it down with ice packs, um, load it down with ice, whatever that is. And then here's some, um, some items that you put in there. Not all of them have to be refrigerated, but it is nice when it's a really hot day, right? To have something that's not burning up and melting. So uh, sandwiches, raw veggies and hummus, roll up. So that would be like a wrap that you add these in ingredients into and cut them into individual bite-sized pieces that can be used from each of the different players. Um, applesauce, rice cakes, pretzels, those are really good for quick energy sources of carbohydrates. The fig bars are also really good for quick energy sources. Um, pasta salads, those might be more if you have a longer period of time between games so that there's a little bit more time for the kids to digest. So if you have a game and you play again in an hour, you probably don't want the pasta salad. But if you have more like three hours between games, then that, that would be a fine option. Same with the turkey sandwich. This is so important, and I want you to hear this, everybody, parents and players and coaches. So important because sleep is, and you've heard it, we have to sleep, right? But it's recommended for adolescents to get between um, seven to nine hours of sleep a day. So the CDC uh, and prevention, so Center for, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that almost 70% of adolescents get less than seven hours of sleep and fewer than 8% get the optimal nine hours of sleep. We're not sleeping enough. I think we all probably know that, but it's important to try to make changes and adjustments to, to regulate that and to improve our sleep habits, especially for adolescents. So deep sleep, if we get into that deep sleep pattern, <clears throat> it helps to release growth hormones and it can lead to enhanced muscle repair. Remember when I said earlier at night when we sleep, a lot of things take place. And that's when a lot of repair takes place.
from our body, from where we've just broken down all those muscles throughout the day. So repair takes place at nighttime while we're sleeping. And once we hit that deep sleep, the protein synthesis happens, repair. Um, sleep deprivation can decrease your growth hormone and increase the stress hormones. So if we're not getting enough sleep and it increases our stress hormones, it can also uh, increase our appetite, but cravings for things that aren't healthy options for us to choose. Um, overnight, it impairs our recovery. So if we are eating, if we're sleeping well, it can repair our recovery and um, decrease your risk of injury. It's important to get adequate sleep and that recommendation is seven to nine hours. Some, some ideas for how to do so is to limit your caffeine intake, hydrate better throughout the day. So don't, as I said earlier, don't wait until right before bedtime to start drinking your water. Start early and drink often. Avoid, avoid large, heavy, fried or greasy meals late at night because that doesn't digest well and it can sit heavy on you um, at night while you're sleeping. Try to turn off your screens. So if you're an adolescent and you're watching right now, when we get off here, turn it off. Turn your screens off at least an hour before bed. Um, and the reason this is important because it does affect the melatonin production um, that helps to enhance our sleep quality. So try to turn off your screens at least an hour before bed. I know this day and age with all the technology that we have out there, it's hard, but it is important. They do have something called blue light glasses that you can purchase um, in case you're doing homework late at night. Um, and then there's some other things like natural production that can help naturally produce the melatonin, not melatonin pills necessarily, but tart cherry juice actually has shown a lot of beneficial um, effects with recovery and sleep, and it helps decrease muscle soreness. Um, and like I said, increases that natural melatonin production. I do encourage you to take that time to sit down with your child, sit down with as a family and think through the meals. Think through what you're gonna have for the rest of the week. What about those snacks? Think through what will work for your family and have a plan, write it down so everyone can see it. Have your child sit down and write things out that they know that they will eat. Like I said, with the protein, what will they eat? And then talk to them about, okay, you'll eat this, but what other things will you include in your plate that fit this healthy performance plate. The one thing I wanted to say about females is that female adolescents especially, so between nine and 13 years old, it's important to at, make sure they're getting eight grams of iron per day and 15, I'm sorry, milligrams, milligrams of iron per day and 15 milligrams of iron for 14 to 18 year olds. Um, and this is really because the onset of menses typically increases that need for iron. And most multivitamins will give them what they need if they're taking a multivitamin. But it is important to include those iron rich foods like that are listed here. Another benefit or another thing to think about with iron absorption is to add a source of vitamin C with that ingredient. That'll help increase the absorption of the iron, such as red bell peppers and citrus fruits. Briefly, I wanna show you this training day plate. So this basically tells everything that I just shared with you. Half your plate should be carbs, a fourth of it protein, and then a fourth of it should be your fruits and veggies. Some of non-starchy veggies, <clears throat> veggies that is, as you see in the picture here. Starchy veggies, remember, they can fit into that half of a plate because they are good quality carbohydrates. I can send this picture out to Darrell um, to make sure that you guys get, because I love this and I love having people just put that up on their refrigerator so that when they're planning their meals, they can think through what, what a plate should look like. Most of the time, food sources up your carbohydrates once in a while, food sources of your carbohydrates, and then some snack ideas to include. Same thing with your proteins. So the key is making sure that those once in a while would be your candy and sugar sweetened beverages, your cakes, your cookies, white breads, white rice, other refined products. And then your, pro your protein sources, we want to be those leaner proteins. And then your fat sources, we want to be those unsaturated fats most often. So if you're not already, you can follow me on uh, Facebook or Instagram, Emily Maddox RDN. And um, also you can email me, you can message me on either of those locations or email me um, if you have questions or comments. Um, I'd love to work with you or your athlete. Um, we have a few questions um, that we already have set up and I see that we've got, you know, some comments coming in about how this is awesome and inform very informative. 
again, Emily, thank you for doing this. Thank you for everyone who's attended. So I'll just start with one of the first questions. Um, what should our soccer players choose from when we're at the hotels and the buffets there and everything? What do we do? So I don't even know if hotels are doing buffets, but when all, th all things get back to normal, they will be. So it can be difficult to find selections, especially when there's stuff out there that you don't normally get, like the beautiful Belgian waffles and the beautiful Danishes and all those wonderful looking foods. It can be hard to say no to this, those things, right? But if your athlete is about to go play three soccer games, it's really crucial that they get quality carbohydrates and not something that's going to load them down and be super high in fat and sugar, right? So one thing that I really encourage you guys to do is consider taking your own breakfast just in case that hotel buffet doesn't have an option that you like or that you have been able to use before. So if you've never tried this before a game, you don't know how that food is going to sit on your stomach and in turn don't know how it'll affect your play, right? So take something that you know that your stomach can handle. So if you've been practicing and going to local games after eating a bowl of oatmeal, then maybe that's what you should take. You can take those instant packs. I like doing the instant packs and adding my own fresh uh, old fashioned roll, rolled oats to that so that it's not nearly as sweet, but you bulk it up a little bit more, adding some fruit to that and maybe even some yogurt. A lot of places have refrigerators in the rooms. So that's something you can call the hotel and ask them, do you have a refrigerator that I can use while I'm there? Oftentimes, if they don't, they'll say, well, we don't have them in every room, but we can get you one. So it's worth the talk. It's worth calling them and asking. But the, the thing is, come prepared. Take, take something that you know your child will eat and they will feel comfortable with. The other thing is, we want to try to avoid those high fat meats. So no sausages, um, bacon, those are high in fat, but stick to like eggs and regular toast. Bagels are good options. English muffins are good options, but we want to try to avoid um, those danishes or the Belgian waffles that are loaded with syrup and whipped cream, okay? Um, but you can do eggs as your protein and then those um, carbohydrates that I mentioned a second ago. Oatmeal is a great option as well. Um, yogurts and fruits, those are good options for buffets at hotels. Another question we had is um, nutrition for the younger ages. You know around the 10 year olds and things like that. A lot of them are on the smaller size. Um, I know as a mother who has the smaller size child, um, I tend to want to shove food at him. What are, what's some nutrition recommendations you can make there? Yeah, great. So a lot of the overall content of what we discussed can still apply. Just their portions are going to be a little bit smaller. Um, the thing to keep in mind is communicate with them and let them know that you don't want them filling up on sugary snack foods because then they get to dinner and they're not hungry. So we wanna to try to communicate with them and talk to them about these things. Also, making sure that healthy snacks are in the house that if they're gonna get a snack, these are their options. Um, so that it makes it harder for them to wanna to just graze through to dinner time or graze through to lunchtime or whatever the time of day it is. Um, but the key is trying to maximize those, those meal times as much as possible. Um, you don't necessarily have to do low fat yogurts or milks. You can do whole fat things for those younger kids as well. Um, but really focusing on the good balance and trying to make sure those healthy options are available for them. We don't necessarily have to shove that food at them, like you mentioned, Kim, um, because those kids most of them still at 10 can listen to their bodies and they can identify, am I really hungry? They don't say that in their head necessarily. It's just how we're born. And then somehow as we get older, we lose that ability. Um, so, so they can still listen to their bodies. And if they're full, they're likely full. But it all is also important to evaluate what happened before that. Did they snack their way through that? And then trying to adjust accordingly. What about um, nutrition for a picky eater when we have these little athletes that run full teal and they're picky eaters? I know you touched on that in the presentation, but any suggestions there? Yeah, 
yeah, that's difficult because you might tell them, hey, you need to eat, this is what, this is what your plate should look like and they don't eat fruit or they don't eat vegetables, right? So that, it can, that can be very difficult. And there are a lot of kids that um, are picky eaters and they don't develop their palate until later, later on. What I encourage you as parents is to not give up. Just because they've tried this one vegetable one time doesn't mean that they don't like it. The more, research has shown that the more often these things are shown to them and provided to them, the more often their taste buds are gonna get used to those flavors. Also trying them prepared in different ways is beneficial. Um, However, I know that you're thinking, oh goodness, that's what, I knew that's what she was going to say. There are ways that you can um, maybe even hide some things in, the, in, in their food. So smoothies are excellent places to do that. You can add some fruits to that. You can slip in a vegetable or two and certainly some avocados in there to thicken it up, but don't go all in. So if you're doing it and you're just starting to do smoothies and adding these fruits and vegetables, don't load it up with fruits and vegetables because they're gonna be able to tell. Just slowly do it, but just a little bit at a time so that they can start getting used to that texture and that flavor of those different things. Um, same thing with meat sauces. You can add shredded uh, carrots or mushrooms to various meat sauces. You can puree it so that, so that it's hiding. Um, it might taste a little different to them, but you don't necessarily have to tell them it has something different in it. Um, just present it. You know, just keep at it is all I have to say. Just keep at it as much as you can because it is a challenge. Um, also talking to them about things that they do like. And then maybe if there's, you know, if they're really picky and there's certain foods that they do like, try to include those things, but making sure that the rest of that plate is balanced and that they um, try those. I love to utilize with my own kids, giving me a no thank you bite. So if they, if they sit down and they look at their plate and I know that they don't want Brussels sprouts, I say, I need a no thank you bite because the more often that they are experiencing these things, the more likely they are to accept them. I don't expect them to love and accept Brussels sprouts at their age necessarily, but I do like to encourage parents to continue at it, work at it and um, you know, try that no thank you bite option. Um, talking about eating healthy on a budget, that's always one of those is, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you think, oh, it's so expensive to eat healthy. How do we eat healthy on a budget? It takes time, but I do encourage you to check the ads for your groceries. Sometimes your favorite grocery store might be incredibly expensive on the fruits, but this other grocery store might have them. So check the ads and find different places that have certain things on sale. Also, if you do go to a specific grocery store, check their ad first and see what is on sale. So find your meat, what meat is on sale and build your recipe or build your menu for that week around these proteins that are available for the week. Also then match your vegetables that are on sale for that week. And then also find a grain that will go with that meal that, um, that you can incorporate into throughout the week. So the, the biggest thing is taking the time to sit down and kind of figure out what's on sale. I also encourage people to actually buy in bulk if you have the space. So if meat goes on sale, buy it in bulk so that you don't, you're not constantly looking for sale on meat. Um, if those veggies are on sale, it's harder to buy in bulk on fruits and veggies because they will go bad. But those are things that you can find at various locations that are on sale, um, whether it's, you know, Publix or Food City or Aldi is a great option as well. Aldi actually has really great prices if you haven't shopped there. Um, and they have organic produce. Not that you have to buy organic by any means. I will say that. And that's a totally different discussion. <laughs> but, um, but there are ways and it just takes time and effort to look at those sales, to look at the ads. But also back to one of the strategies that we talked about is planning ahead. Finding out, you know, if you're, if you're at the last minute on a Wednesday night and you say, oh, I don't have a plan for dinner. I guess we'll just go through the drive-through. You know, that if that happens often, that can add up on your expenses. So for planning ahead, it's easier to um, fit your grocery groceries into your budget that you have. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.